The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. It is welcome, 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 welcome. It is wonderful to be back after 10 months taking a hiatus to finish my book and do some um, pretty big client projects. So thank you so much for joining me live, those of you that are here. And for those of you who are listening afterwards, welcome to you as well. Um, I'd like to do a quick sound check, make sure you can hear me okay, and also give you practice raising your hand so that when we get to the Q&A, you know where your little hand is to raise and let me know that you can hear me loud and clear, please. So if you could just raise your hands. All right. Good, good, good. Excellent. I'm going to go ahead and remove those, take those down so I know when you're um, raising it later. So I'm well, I'm really excited to be talking for the first time uh, to a large group that's not a live audience in person about clarity. And, you know, clarity first is my most recent book came out a few months ago. And it's something that I've been thinking about for decades, I believe now in retrospect. Um, and it's something that is seemingly simple. The concept is seemingly simple, and what I found as I started thinking about it and experimenting with clients and then writing the book is that it is anything but simple, but it is absolutely vital for business performance at high levels and for improvement work at any, any type of improvement work. So this is the first of five webinars that I'll be offering this summer, and you can see the other four webinars listed here. Uh, you can go on our website, and by the way, I am in the process of changing our business name from the Karen Martin Group to TKMG, which stands for the Karen Martin Group. Um, so you can either use the old uh, URL, ksmartin.com or tkmg.com, both get you to the same place. And there's a registration area there for each of the four remaining webinars. And yes, I know many of you have said, why do I have to register for each one individually? It's, it's not my design. I, I wish you could just register once for all of them, but it's how GoToWebinar is set up, and we have found them to be the most reliable provider so far of webinars. So there you go. Um, we'll go into a deep dive. Today will be a bit of an overview, and we'll touch just briefly on each of these topics, and then the rest of them will be a deeper dive into uh, one or two of the topics as the case may be. I hope to see you for all of those as well. As usual, all webinars are recorded and they will all be available on our website, on YouTube, and on Vimeo, and on SlideShare. So it's in all four of our major social media sites. Okay, so it's the first thing that people ask me all the time is, why Clarity, Karen? Why, why did you even write this book? Well, some of you have read The Outstanding Organization, and some of you will remember that in The Outstanding Organization, I talk about the four fundamental behaviors that are necessary in order to achieve outstanding performance. And clarity was one of those four behaviors, and that so I view The Outstanding Organization as a prequel of sorts to clarity first. In The Outstanding Organization, what was interesting to me was that the four fundamental behaviors or conditions that need to be set in an organization, clarity, focus, discipline, and engagement, of those four, clarity received the most emails from readers, the, mo the most, um, you know, kind of diverse and deep questions around clarity. And I knew that clarity was something that was needed a little bit of a deeper treatment, which is why I decided to go for it. Whether I'll do a separate book on focus, focus, discipline, and engagement down the road, I don't know. But I do know that clarity was not as easy to write as I thought it would be. I thought a single subject book would be really easy, and it was anything but. So what is clarity? Let's start out with that. What is it? Well, I like to actually talk about clarity first by what it is not. I think it's easier to understand what it is not than sometimes what it is. So what it is not is ambiguity. Ambiguity, the way I view it, is like a fog. It's this kind of you know, not knowing, not being sure, not being confident, um, not being able to really see the truth, not being able to see reality. Uh, it's just that underlying fog that pervades business today, organizations of all sorts, government, military, education, you know, every organization has some level of ambiguity, and in many organizations, very high levels of ambiguity that they're trying to operate within. So ambiguity is the opposite of clarity. Now, what does ambiguity do? 
Well, for an organization, the biggest risk is ambiguity leads to missteps, errors, and rework. So you can take it all the way from in healthcare, which is life and death often, you know, people dying due to medication errors or surgical errors. Ambiguity can lead to, um, you know, errors in office work. So correspondence can go out to financial services. Uh, beneficiaries and, and financial services clients that can lead them to make decisions about what to do with their money that are in, in error. There are all kinds of things that you know happen when it's not super clear what needs to be done and why and who it's being done to and why and all of those types of things that clarity enables. The other thing that happens is ambiguity is very frustrating. Anytime, I mean, you think about it, think about your own experience. If you're an employee within the organization, if you're a consultant or someone on the outside working with clients, anytime you don't know for sure what is going on, what is being asked of you, what you should do, where you should go, anytime that happens, it introduces this psychic drain. It's this energy drain where you have to stop and try to figure things out. And we never suggest that you shouldn't try to clarify when something is unclear. What we do suggest is that we need to be working diligently to remove the need for clarification at its root because it is frustrating to not understand. Clarity builds confidence. Clarity helps us become more competent because it's more clear what we should be doing when and why and to whom and all of those things. The other thing is ambiguity is incredible incredibly expensive. So it's expensive in terms of wasted supplies and materials. It's expensive in terms of the rework that we have to do. And it's just darn expensive in terms of the lack of productivity or the, the eroding productivity that ambiguity creates. So when people are in an organization and they're trying to figure things out and taking the time to try to figure things out rather than it being clear to begin with so you can actually start taking action, that is an incredible productivity drain, and organizations are filled with this. It is prevalent if you start, you know, once one of the purposes I, of writing the book was so I could just help people heighten their awareness to the degree to which this is a problem and then to do something about it. So the first step is understanding, and once you start thinking about it and noticing it, you're going to see the lack of clarity everywhere. <laughs> and it, it may actually drive you a little crazy <laughs> because now that I'm you know, so into the whole clarity thing, it's like, oh, the lack of clarity, I, it just makes me a little crazy. Um, so it is everywhere, and we need to do our work and our jobs to try to re reduce it. What clarity is not is clarity is not the same thing as certainty. So a lot of people, you know, when they first start talking, they think, ah, oh, you can't be clear about everything. Life is uncertain. Indeed, life is uncertain. Business is uncertain. That's not what clarity is. So you can be incredibly clear about the lack of certainty and take appropriate action because you're operating in that environment where you don't have, clear, you don't have certainty. You can still have clarity. Certainty is one of those things where it's really rare to get absolute certainty, unequivocal certainty. It's very difficult to get that. But you can get very, very clear about every aspect of work and, and the environment. And even if you're going after a new product, for example, new product development, and you're not certain how it's going to be perceived in the marketplace, and you're not certain if it's going to work as expected and all those things, you can still get very clear about every step along the way that will increase the likelihood that you're going to get the outcomes that you're looking for. So that's you know a, a short version of the difference between clarity and certainty, not the same. What clarity is, is it's having absolute coherence, precision, and elegance around everything that we say and do and understand. So coherence is a matter of things making sense and, and being somewhat consistent. It's also, coherence is also a sign of a, a system-wide thinking type of thing. So coherence is, you know, every, all the parts kind of fit together. And anytime you have communication or any kind of information being passed on where things don't quite fit together, then you lack coherence in that. Precision is about having predictable and very specific kinds of information being communicated. So yesterday I was working with a team on developing standard work 
and we were, you know, helping, I was helping them map out the, you know, step one, step two, step three, step four. And there was a step where there were two different functional areas and the, the item that was being passed from one area to the other area, there needed to be a clear trigger on when does it get passed and who passes it? Does the first area pass it to the second area? Does the second area pass it to the first area? So it's the same item. And there was lack of clarity on who should do what, when, and, and why. And so working with that group to say, okay, there, you need to have precision here. Either area one submits to area two or area two submits to area one. And if there need to be any exceptions to the rule, then you clarify those exceptions. You know, maybe group two submits to group one, except for Tuesdays at noon. <laughs> or so, you know, I'm, I'm being silly, but something like that. But then you get clear about that. And putting precision into all of our work processes and all of the information that's being conveyed from customer information to internal information to supply chain information, all of that is critical to have clarity. And the last element is elegance. Elegance to me is, to me is simplicity. It's easy, it's simple, there's not a lot of extra fluff around, it's you know, being more direct and frank with your conversation, not being mean, but being, you know, just quick to the point and not having a lot of ah, da, 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 da. And one of the things that's interesting is when you start asking people a question, I encourage you to start listening to the answers very carefully from an elegance perspective. How often do you ask a quick question or a simple question and you get this and then people go on and on and on and you have to kind of sort through all that. That's the fog. You have to sort through that fog to get to what is the answer. And so I experiment a lot with asking a binary question, meaning it can be answered with yes or no, just to see how someone's thinking and how elegantly they can respond in order to know, you know, to what degree I need to work with them on building greater clarity and being able to communicate with greater clarity. And very often people cannot start with yes or no. They go on and on and on and on and you have to sort through whether they mean yes or no. And you yourselves may find yourself sometimes doing this for a variety of reasons, but you want to try to break that habit and get to a more elegant answer to the question so that people can move on and take the appropriate action or make the appropriate decisions that need to be made. So at the end of the day, what we're trying to do and help is help individuals and organizations as a collective whole move from this kind of pervasive fog where people are not quite sure what's going on to some level of clarity where you're able to get the all the people in the organization being able to move quickly and decisively and not have to wade through a bunch of muck in order to figure out you know, what they should be doing and what kinds of decisions should be being made. That's the goal. Now, I'd like to talk about you know, what actually happens in organizations. That's the ideal. Now, what actually happens in organizations, and this is one of the most disturbing cases I heard of when I was researching the book. And what happened with, at Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant in Japan, many of you may remember this, was that on Friday, March 11th, 2011, Everyone goes to work thinking it's going to be a beautiful day and everything's going to be fine. The operators of the plant were doing their normal morning work. And then the morning starts getting a little bit later. And of course, they've got meetings and emails and phone calls and life is going on just as normal. At 2.46 p.m. on Friday, March 11, 2011, a magnitude 9.0 earthquake hit the plant. The good news was the plant survived and it didn't seem to have much damage. But an hour later, 3.42 p.m., a 15-meter tsunami hit the region. And then there was another one eight minutes later. And this is when things started unraveling. All three of the units that were operating at that time of the outer earthquake lost power. And a few minutes later, the station was in a complete blackout. Not good. Really not good because the organization had very good, robust, uh, the ability to withstand earthquakes, and they had great processes for what you do in the case of an earthquake. They did not have the infrastructure. The plant could not handle the effects of that type of a tsunami, which is basically 15 meters or 49 feet high. They couldn't withstand that, and there were no processes for what to do in the case of a complete blackout because no one thought it was possible. So contingency planning was definitely part of the problem. 
Another part of the problem, however, that resulted in lots and lots of people having to be displaced from their homes permanently, many of whom were exposed to nuclear radiation because the next day, the first of many explosions occurred and there was nuclear um, uh, waste that was you know, put into the air and these, all these people in that region, not all of them had been evacuated. In fact, many of them had not been evacuated. So now they're being exposed to nuclear material. And what we found, what the research found when they started going back and reenacting, you know, the, the steps in what happened was that the word core meltdown had been banned from the vocabulary by leadership. So basically leadership had an actual stated rule that you don't use the term meltdown because it evokes all kinds of emotions and it means, you know, very, very dire things. And so there was the engineers that were involved in this started using lesser terms besides core meltdown. In fact, they had a press conference and one guy used the word meltdown because he was in the middle of a heated Q&A with the media and he was immediately dismissed from his post. He was gone. So this was a big deal. They banned the word meltdown and many people now believe that that ban, that lack of clarity of language is what allowed the, the whole progression of events to get as bad as they did to the point where now, uh, you know, no one is being very clear <laughs> on the number of deaths that are directly related to the nuclear plant versus the tsunami itself. Some say the low end is 573. That was one report I read. Some say 2000. And then one recent report I read said that they believe that there will be 5,000 deaths within a 10-year period or a 15-year period that are directly due to being exposed to nuclear, um, to radiation. So these are directly nuclear poisoning, radi radiation-related deaths, many of which probably could have been avoided with some simple processes and clarity around the language that they should have been using. So that was the most dire of all the different circumstances that I, I uh, read in the biggest ticket because it's now being um, priced at billions of dollars to repair all of this. Now, that's a serious case. I want to share with you kind of a lighter hearted case. And this is, um, I moved to Santa Monica a few years ago. I actually just moved to Dallas, Texas. So this was two years ago. I moved to Santa Monica and there's a pretty bad parking problem in Santa Monica. For those of you who might know, it's very, very crowded. And so I was going to the grocery store my first day there and I went round and round the block several times and finally turned the corner. I'm like, ah, yes, a parking place. So I pulled up and this is literally the signage at my parking place. And so I parked and then I got out and said, now, can I really park here? And I, it, I stood there and I, watched, I looked at it for a good five minutes trying to figure out if in fact I could park there. And I concluded I could, but I didn't have high confidence. I wasn't quite sure if I really could park there. And uh, and this is just an example. When you start looking around, you see this lack of clarity all over the place. And it, you know, it takes time and effort and it robs us of our productive time that we could be doing other more meaningful things and adding value to both our families, our society, you know, our, our communities and to our customers. So it's everywhere. Well, what does it take? to operate with incredible clarity. It takes two fundamental mindsets, and one's a mindset of humility and operating with humility, and one's a mindset of curiosity and operating with curiosity. Let me explain. So if you think about when we're born as little kids, there's no doubt that kids are incredibly curious beings. They are, you know, the, what, what does a two-year-old say all the time? Ask, ask their parents, why mommy, why daddy, why, why, why? And when are we gonna be there and all those things. There's a lot of curiosity. But what happens is well-meaning parents who are tired or overworked or juggling too much will start getting a little impatient with those incessant questions. And so little by little, the impatience starts coming through either implicitly or explicitly with some with parents saying, you know, stop with the questions already. <laughs> you know? And then kids get into school and their teachers do some of the same things. And then they become employees and they become they start getting that curiosity tamped out of them as well. So that does not feel good to know that you can't be curious. It does not feel good. And what happens is we get programmed. Many of us get programmed from the time we're very small 
Fast forward to now we're adults. Fast forward to we're now leading teams where we're leading improvement and we're carrying forward all of that programming we got as kids that curiosity was bad. And then you add to that things like curiosity, um, Curious George, you know, what happened with Curious George, one of the most famous kids stories. Well, he always got into trouble when he was being curious. And then you have things like, you know, sayings like curiosity killed the cat. You know, that curiosity has gotten a pretty bad rap in the world and this is not good. And so as leaders, as improvement professionals, part of our job, a big part of our job is to reignite that curiosity that got tamped down and drummed out of us as kids. We need to bring it up. We need to give people a safe space to become curious again. And when people become curious again, they light up and they the world looks like it's a all in color again. Curiosity is a beautiful thing. And curiosity is what makes for great problem solving. Curiosity is what makes for good leadership ultimately. So it's our job to help stimulate or re-stimulate that curious kind of innate sense that we've always had. The other thing I want to talk about before I get to humility is cognitive biases. So your know, cognitive biases are things that we carry around a lot and it's just the way we think for various reasons often based in fear and there have now been up to 180 different cognitive biases that have been identified so this is a bias toward a political point of view it's a bias toward how an industry should op operate it's a bias toward how an individual will react it's a bias toward how a process should perform it's a bias toward a particular customer group I mean there's all kinds of biases we have and biases are necessary their biases are actually good in some cases if we have high degrees of self-awareness so what we need to do is start being very clear when we're operating from a bias and then test ourselves and continually think, hmm, is that really true or am I operating from a bias and seek the truth and seek facts that helps break down our biases. This is not an easy image to see, but I wanted to share it with you because it shows this beautiful codex that this gentleman you see at the bottom here, John Mnugian, I think is how you pronounce it. He created this beautiful piece of art that shows all the different biases and it classifies them into four big buckets and then sub buckets and then sub sub buckets. So you can see there's a lot of complexity to how we think. And you can find this by going to Wikimedia or you can just Google John Mnugian and and it'll come up cognitive bias codex it'll come up but I just was fascinated when I saw this and was reading all the different biases that are present in many of our brains so becoming very self-aware that we're operating from a place of bias is important for moving forward and if you're facilitating improvement teams you can help them start seeing when they're operating from a bias just based on the kinds of things that they say and the answers they give to questions you ask Related to biases are assumptions. So what does this say? All right, how many of you said jumping to conclusions? <laughs> I bet many of you did, most of you did. What's it say? It does not say jumping to conclusions. <laughs> <laughs> it says some variation of, you know, whatever, whatever you want to, however you want to pronounce that. So, you know, this is just something, again, where our brains are kind of habituated to jump into conclusions. And you see this a lot in problem solving where people just jump to a conclusion without the facts. So what we want to do, again, is start becoming aware of this and start helping people not jump to conclusions, but rather be responsible in getting the facts before they conclude anything. Um, now, time. So time is another problem. People often will um, you know, leap to solutions and operate from biases and not seek clarity because of time. It's like, there's, I don't have enough time. I can't do it. It takes too much time. But here's the thing. You yourselves need to help you know, understand that by not taking the time to clarify, we are creating a longer time frame for getting anything done down the road. It takes a lot of time for people to clarify and to undo work that shouldn't have been done to begin with and to correct problems that shouldn't have occurred if there had been greater clarity. So overall, it actually takes far less time to clarify. We just have to start shifting our mind into understanding that if you take the time up front, 
then it will help you down the end. And many of you have heard me say, go slow to go fast. Go slow to go fast. So being methodical up front and clarifying up front saves everybody a lot of time downstream. At the end of the day, at the bottom of all of these different things, including operating with a lack of humility, which I'll talk about again in just a moment, there is fear. Fear is at the core of all these different behaviors. And so, again, becoming self-aware of what am I afraid of? What, why am I doing this? And asking those, you know, it's called metacognition, where you're able to think about how you think. And in, the more self-aware you become, the better you'll be able to catch yourself using these habitual patterns that you want to now shift into a more productive, healthy way so that you can operate with greater clarity, you can seek greater clarity, and all of your performance, your quality of life, everything goes up whenever you operate with clarity. So one thing to think about is to what degree are you in any of these three categories of clarity types? So there's a clarity pursuer, clarity avoider, and then there's someone and in, in whole organizations operate sometimes as in being clarity blind, meaning that you don't really see the need for clarity or you see it and you choose actively to not seek it, and then you become more of a clarity avoider. So I'll explain all three of those in right now. Right now. So most individuals and most organizations enter a lot of situations in the clarity blind camp. So type one clarity blind people and organizations are unaware that clarity even matters. Type two are aware, but they don't understand that they're not clear. And that's the tricky one. If you, you know, are writing emails and people are not able to understand what you're saying and you don't, under, you don't see that your emails are unclear, it's difficult. So one way to start breaking that habit is to have others give you feedback about what you're writing and give you feedback about what you're saying and continually check for understanding by asking people if they, you know, are, are fully clear on what you're saying. And I, and tone matters. So this isn't saying, are you clear? <laughs> Not that. Um, but, you know, checking for understanding. And then as you become aware, then you have a choice of either being clear or unclear. So let's talk about what happens when you go down the, the dark path, <laughs> the dark path toward clarity avoidance. So there are three types, as I found as I was researching. Type one clarity avoiders are, you know, sociopathic. They're intentionally deceiving. Um, it's not good. It's for no reason, no good reason that they're deceiving. And so these are, you know, the rare sociopaths that we see in the in the workplace. Type two clarity avoiders use what I call strategic ambiguity, meaning that there may be good reason to, in a limited limited number of situations, be a little intentionally ambiguous. So examples of this would be if you're in the middle of a merger and acquisition and you don't want the other party to get the upper hand on a negotiation or even in a sales environment, if you don't want the customer to really know what your pricing really is, you know, obviously you're not going to go, well, yeah, man, that's only $99.95 for our cost. And so then you've, lo you've lost your leverage as a negotiator. So there are times when it makes sense. But you should never use strategic ambiguity when it's going to do harm or has the potential to do harm. And you should not use it under the guise of, you know, well, I'm not being intentionally deceitful. I'm just using strategic ambiguity. That's, you know, that's a mask that, that you shouldn't be doing. So limited circumstances call for strategic ambiguity. The type three clarity avoider is a little dangerous in that it's willful ignorance. So you're intentionally choosing to not know. And, you know, leaders do this more than we would like. Uh, we see leaders often not asking the questions of their teams. This happened at Wells Fargo, for example, with the whole problem Wells Fargo. Many, many, many interviews showed that the leaders simply didn't ask the clear and, you know, easy, basic questions that would have uncovered the whole um, the kind of system of deceit that was going on, but they chose not to ask the questions. That's will for ignorance. 
Willful, ignor willful ignorance on a personal level is not asking your partner questions that might allow you to learn that there's something that he or she is doing that's you know not in line with what you believe they should be doing. Those kinds of things. So that's clarity avoidance. And we want to reduce the amount of time we operate in the clarity avoidance camp and maximize the time we move over here to the better place to be, which is clarity pursuer. So a clarity pursuer is consistently pursuing clarity, both as an information provider and as a recipient. So they're being, you know, they're an equal opportunity pursuer and looking at it from both directions and doing everything they can to be clear both directions. Now, I want to go back to clarity avoider. So strategic ambiguity also applies to personal relationships when someone's asking you a question and it would be incredibly harmful or hurtful to be super blunt with them. You know, you can soften the bluntness without lying and you can deal with it directly by, you know, talking with the person about why are they asking that question and start, you know, having getting into the why behind things helps you you know be able to avoid getting into that awkward strategic ambiguity phase so that people can hear the truth more often so those are the three different buckets and we all kind of flip back and forth in these but most people operate primarily from one place or the other and you you know you need to think about how you are at work versus how you are at home and at work how you are with peers versus with um subordinates or or leaders you know, above you or you know how you, we do flip around and we want to just make sure that we're being as honest with ourselves and moving toward the clarity pursuing bucket as much as we possibly can so let's talk about organizational clarity um, and what I did was I looked at organizational performance and the types of clarity eroding behaviors and what they did to performance and then came up with this you know five this taxonomy of these five areas that organizational clarity seems to be lacking the most so purpose priorities process performance and problem solving are the five P's each of the the subsequent webinars are going to go into great detail on these, but I'm going to go ahead and give you a little bit of an overview today. So purpose. This has been fascinating to, for me to dig deeply into this whole mission, vision, values, operating principles, and, and understand the difference between them and, and see the amount of ambiguity and lack of clarity that exists in organizations around those terms, even business call business school professors don't even agree sometimes on the difference between all of those but you know I take the position that you know mission is good to you know, be clear about what you do and a vision is good to figure out where you want to be in you know five or ten years and what you want to be how you want to be serving whoever you serve that's good as well but what's lacking in almost all organizations is a very very clear purpose for that organization existing so why do you do what you do? And you know, I started really um, playing around with this years and years ago when I read Simon Sinek's uh, book, Start With Why. And that book actually inspired my title, Clarity First, for this book was kind of inspired with Simon, Start With Why. So why you do what you do becomes a, the great glue to attract employees and keep employees in the organization, team members, um, associates whatever you want to call them and it also is an attractant to customers as well when an organization has a strong sense of why so here's an example of what versus why so i asked a very key leader in a tire manufacturer who you know is really sharp guy why they do what they do and he answered to produce high quality tires and I said, well, that's what you do. You produce tires. And he goes, yeah, but why we do it is because we want them to be very high quality. I said, mm, so I'm going to challenge you on that. Why you make high quality tires is goes deeper. So this is where you have to take what an organization does and start looking at what is what is the effect of what that product is, whether it's a service or a good. What is the effect of it? What does it do for the customer? And it's often emotional. So some of you may remember in the outstanding organization, I said value is a verb. Value is also emotional. So 
the issue with the tires is it yes it's a high quality tire but what it's doing is it's enabling someone to safely and reliably and with high confidence get from point a to point b and that feeling of safety and reliability and confidence is the emotional you know underpinnings of why that organization exists when you start tying the why and start recruiting based on it and start making decisions based on it and start talking about it on a regular basis internally, you get incredible boosts in engagement and in, in people becoming loyal to the organization because it's not about the thing. It's about what the thing does for people. So I break it down in the book in Clarity First for, you know, the first level is what do you do? So what good or service are you providing? Then what do you really do? Meaning what problem or problems does your good or service solve for a customer? And then why do you do it? That's when you get to what your purpose is. So I encourage all of you, you know, maybe get a little study group or a little team together and talk about these three questions and, and get clear on the problem or problems your good or service solves. That in and of itself is a great clarifying exercise. And then dig, dig even deeper into your purpose. Why do you do that? And oftentimes you need to go back to the founder of an organization to understand what drove them to start the company or the organization in the first place. And um, that, that often provides a lot of insight into why, what, why the organization exists. All right, the next thing is priorities. So <laughs> organizations, you know, we work with so many organizations, and, oh, I just wish so much that it was uh, a much more clear organizationally what the priorities really are and why they matter. Um, what you, you know, will hear about in continuous improvement literature, lean literature, is this concept of true north. So this is becoming very, very clear on what you're trying to achieve so that your priorities can align with that. And all too often what we see are different parts of the organization actually working at cross purposes and conflicting with one another in terms of what they're deeming as a priority versus there being consensus organizationally at what the priority should be and why, and then having everyone move in a singular direction true that, toward that true north. So the thing that is interesting about lean management is that almost every single one of the practices are very, very strong clarity enabling practices. So strategy deployment or Hoshin Conry or Hoshin planning is one of those practices that is very clarifying and very powerful. So for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's a clear, focused, disciplined, and deeply engaging approach to achieving measurable business goals, so measurement matters, that enable the organization to realize its strategy, its longer term strategy, and stay true to its purpose. So strategy deployment is an alignment, and it's a consensus building and alignment vehicle to get everyone marching in the same direction so you don't have cross purposes. And I'm, not, I'm going to go into lots of detail in the next webinar about this, and I'll show you some strategy deployment plans and things like that and to talk about it. But it is a powerful tool, and it's, um, it's underused, and it's hard to start with, but it's very powerful once you get proficiency in it. And um, it's, it's just it's huge. It's, uh, it's foundational. If you want to have very, very high-performing organizations, it's foundational. So the next one is process, and again, I'll go into all the details behind this in the um, upcoming webinars, but from a process perspective, what we see is most organizations have either no documented processes, or they're documented and very, very old, or they're documented and not followed, or all of the above, and or vague, the processes are, you know, kind of incomprehensible and so we really need to work a lot on process and you know it's kind of weird that we've been talking about process for decades and decades and we still see the you know kind of novice um, elementary level of process um, sensitivity and process adherence and process um, awareness in organizations it's 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 kind of shocking 
that we're where we're at. But so, you know, at a high level, understanding how your value streams perform and getting clarity around that and then using that clarity to drive improvement, that is absolutely essential to get very, very clear on that. So there's, you know, lots of ways to learn about value stream uh, performance and mapping is only one piece of it. You know, you use the map in order to have the conversations that need to be had. And then the outcome of the mapping is typically a transformation plan. And that's the real, that's the real important part. It's not the map. It's the map is the means to getting that transformation plan together and having leadership consensus around what needs to happen across the value stream to improve performance. So that's one level of clarity that you need. The other one is at both a value stream and at a process level, starting to use, if those of you who aren't already using this metric, it's it's key. I mean, we find Mike Osterling, who co-wrote several of our books, he and I kind of worked on this together, and he calls it the hidden beast, which I think is such a great description. It's the hidden beast in organizations who don't measure percent complete and accurate, meaning the percentage of time that work that's produced by, let's say, person or department or work unit number one, the degree of time that work is passed to number two, the recipient or the customer of that work, and they're able to do whatever they do without having to do any form of rework. And here we define rework as correcting, adding, and clarifying. Bo Keat and Drew Locker came up with the first two in their definition in their book, The Complete Lean Enterprise, that rework is correcting and adding information that should have been there. And Mike and I added clarification way back in, I don't know, 2005 maybe? And we've been using that ever since. And we find that clarification is more prevalent than even correcting and adding in many, set in many settings. And so basically you're asking what is the quality of the output that becomes the next person's input and then you look at the percentage and this is a subjective but you know it's a subjective answer that's done that's answered by people who are experts in the work what percentage of the time they have to do some form of rework and you start finding the, deg the degree of ambiguity that exists in information as, as it's being passed down a process. And so then you can do root cause analysis and you can, um, you know, put a countermeasure in place to improve the quality, which improves everyone's experience of the work and then ultimately the outcome of that work. Another thing is standard work. You know, again, we've been talking about standard work in the lean community for two decades at least now, and yet we find that standard work isn't well written, it's not um, accessible, it's not well used, if it exists at all. And, you know, the time has come to get serious about this. It, standard work is key. You can't manage an area if you don't have standards by which people need to operate and someone monitoring that and then continuously improving it. So standard work for all key processes that's current needs to be put in place. It's almost like this, you know, parable of the blind men that are, you know, touching different parts of the elephant and they, you know, they only see what they can see right in front of them. They can't see the whole thing. And without clarity of process, we'll never be able to operate well as an organization. Always will cost more money to run the business. It'll take more people to run the business. It'll take more heroics to, biz to run the business and you know you need to get really clear about process in order to have a well-oiled machine. So they need to be documented, current, followed, consistently monitored and regularly improved. Those are the five criteria for robust process management. All right, next is performance. So let's talk about this. Imagine that you're at a football game or pick your favorite sport and there's a scoreboard with nothing on it. Imagine how unsettling that is for you to not understand what the score is, who's winning, in this case, what quarter it is, who has the ball, how many yards are there to go, you know, all of those key things that allow people to know what to do. Having a scoreboard helps you know what to do. So in your car, you've got a dashboard. The dashboard tells you what you need to do. If you're, you know, fuel goes down, you need to fuel up. If your temperature goes up, you need to find the root cause of that. You know, all of those things are critical in order to feel confident that you know that you're doing the right work and you're getting the right result. So imagine 
going to a football game. And it's not even just the audience and the, the referees rely on the scoreboard, the team members, the quarterback relies on the scoreboard. Everyone relies on the scoreboard. And yet in business, we somehow think that we can operate without scoreboards. Doesn't make much sense. So what we need to do, and I go into great detail in the book about level one, two, and level three scoreboards, scorecards, or dashboards, you can call it any of the above. You know, level three scorecard would be a high level organization scoreboard, scorecard that has the, you know, key, KP, the key performance indicators, KPIs, that matter most at the top, top level of the organization. And then you might have a division or a business unit scorecard or scoreboard, and then you might have department or work team level scoreboards, scorecards. So this enables everyone to see where you're at and what needs to be done. And it makes it clear and unequivocal what's going on so that people know what action needs to be taken. And you can't run from the truth. You know, when scorecards are not visual and on walls and they're in a computer system, people sometimes think, woohoo, we got a scorecard. It does not matter if it's hidden in a computer. It's like it doesn't exist. So it needs to be out in the open for everyone to see. Another thing about performance is that, you know, we are sometimes operating in a fog about data. And, and it, yes, it may be difficult to get data, but to try to run a business or to make improvement without any data at all is a bit risky. In fact, it's a lot risky. And so this is an example. This is only one of many examples um, that you know, I, I put in the book that show, you know, what you can do with clarity. In this case, this was a real customer, and this was a customer that had high confidence that they were staffing to demand, and yet they kept getting all these cues building up, whip, work in process. And, you know, we could see pretty quickly that they weren't staffing to demand, but, you know, we had to show them that they weren't working to demand, staffing to demand by getting the data. And you see this big disconnect between when the patient, this is, this is healthcare, when the patients are arriving and when the physicians are available and then when the physicians were actually scheduled to be available versus the blue lines being when they were available. So, you know, pretty pretty big mismatch between patient arrival and physician availability. And we see this over and over. Another thing with performance is being very, very clear about what, what performance you're going after. So what is the target? And this is a controversial one, but it's one that I, I include because it is controversial, is that it's provocative, is that sometimes we think that we always want to be moving in the, you know, kind of um, common sense way. Like we want to see the number of reported safety risks go down, right? Not necessarily. When you're first implementing an improvement to an area, if there's been a, an environment of fear and if people have not felt safe reporting it, then you may actually want to see an increase in the number of safety violations that are reported initially. And then as you get more clarity around the true current state and then can do robust root cause analysis, then of course you want to see that number go down. So, you know, sometimes having those tough conversations with leadership and saying, you know, the right thing to do is actually see this number go up, even though that's counterintuitive to where we want to go. Initially, we need to see that in order to know that we're reducing the fear so we can start uncovering more of the safety risks. So this is, um, this is something that we see a lot as being clear about what direction the target needs to go in initially. And then daily management. So this is something that we've been getting more and more and more into and, and helping clients get more and more sophisticated with their daily management systems. You know, there, a well done huddle at the beginning of the day or at the beginning of shifts and sometimes even at the end of the day or the end of the shifts, a well done huddle around a well crafted board makes all the difference in the world in terms of performance because people are in one moving in one direction they're clear about the problems that are currently being solved they're clear about how they're currently performing there's just no ambiguity about it when you have a well designed daily management system so this is you know again lean has offered us all the tools we need and all the practices we need to operate with high, high, high degrees of clarity. We just have to do them. <laughs> we have to use them. 
And and daily management, the other thing about it is that you know this is where you know leaders, supervisors, team leads can start sensing where there is ambiguity so that they can help do something about it. Is you know by the people talking about what the performance actually is and seeing the truth of the current state, you're able to help everyone move on the same page and get clarity around the work at a local level. So daily management in work teams and departments is critical for clarity of performance. And last is problem solving. So this is a big one. I'm not going to talk hardly at all about it because it is so big and we have a single webinar coming up just on problem solving. But suffice it to say, uh-oh, what happened to my problem solving? Oh no, I lost my slide. Oh no, what happened? Okay, wow. Um, I did QC right before the webinar. I don't, I seriously don't know what happened. Well, let me just say this. I have, um, I have been thinking about PDSA and PDCA, Plan, Do, Study, Adjust, and Plan, Do, Check, Act, for about a decade now, deep thinking. And I've concluded that people are still as unclear about what the P, the D, and the C, and the A, or the S and the A mean as they were, uh, you know, several decades ago. And so I've replaced talking about everything in a statement format by questions. So now I have a series of questions that we ask in each stage to help people. And you can use it with DMAIC, you can use it with 8 Ford's 8D, you can use it with OODA, you can use it with any problem solving model. It's the questions that matter and answering the questions help people get clearer on what's actually being asked of them in each stage of the uh, PDSA. So I'm really sorry that it's missing the slide and I don't know whether it's in the handout that you guys got or whether it's missing from that as well. Maybe I just didn't do a save as. I, I'm, I'm really sorry about that. But we will talk about it in detail on the problem solving webinar. So finally, that's all the organizational clarity. And those five P's are the different areas that organizations need to be clear in. But no level of organizational clarity occurs without all of its leaders and all of its workers starting to operate with greater clarity as well. So one of the things that we are getting very, very interested in is this concept of mindfulness and getting people able to operate where they're very present, they're aware, they are in a safe environment to raise issues and, and surface problems and operating with that. So think about your level of awareness and mindfulness and think about how you can start contributing to your organization having greater clarity and then also maybe talk with your leaders about their role in operating with clarity and start asking clarifying questions, more clarifying questions than maybe you even thought you needed to. Start, start experimenting with that. Clarity pause is something that enables you to operate with clarity where before you hit send, you think about your email and think about whether you've had the ask up front, what do you want list that first and then give the background. I just got an email from someone that is super long and I'm reading this email. I had no clue what the guy wants me to do. I don't know whether I'm supposed to make a decision, if I'm supposed to take an action. I have no clue. I got all the way down. It was like two screens of email and the very last thing said, so could you please let me know? And then he finished the sentence and I'm like, oh my gosh, I wish I would have known that up front. I just spent two minutes reading your email and had no idea. So it's, it's important that we all work toward greater clarity and pass that on. It's a gift. We want to pay it forward. Pass it on. So at the end of the day, what we want to do is create work environments where everyone can operate with high degrees of confidence, and high degrees of confidence helps build competence. And through that level of clarity that we infuse in the organization, you can really have this very liberating, uh, much more engaging and fulfilling work environment that helps people go home at the end of the day feeling like, hey, I really contributed. And that wasn't too shabby. It was, it was a pretty good day. And we can start getting rid of the drag that sometimes people feel at the end of the day. 
So there's a Clarity quiz. It's a free quiz that uh, we're offering that you can take uh, going to clarityfirstquiz.com, which helps you see where you rate and where your organization rates. And I encourage you to take that, especially if you're going to take the next uh, series of webinars. That would be helpful to know where you're currently at. Get your baseline. And I invite you to buy the book for greater detail as well. And it also would help us with you know, probably some deeper questions at the end of the webinar. So um, I hope those of you who got it are enjoying it. And um, it was a hard book to write, but I th I'm, I'm pretty proud of it. I think, I think I did a pretty good job. So you'll be the judge. You're the readers. <laughs> so thank you so much. Let's move to a few quick questions here. Um, go ahead and start writing your questions in. And, um, or you can raise your hand, and I will take some verbal questions. And those of you that are going to scoot off real quickly, thank you so much for joining. And hope to see you on the other webinars. But don't scoot. These questions are usually really good. So stay here. Okay. Um, comment. Ironic that HR professionals are advocating to do away with performance reviews as people don't value them. In reality, it's one giant lack of clarity space, fewer time, cognitive, cognitive biases, etc. Well, so I actually am with HR professionals that are doing away with performance reviews in the way that they've currently been done. So what I don't enjoy is I don't enjoy seeing an organization do an annual review. So it's a batch of one, one time a year. Everybody has to wait the year to get any feedback because after all, that's what leaders do is they wait for their, you know, um, the performance reviews. And it also doesn't give people real time feedback, which is critical. So what I'd rather see are managers being given and leaders being given more time to actually lead and manage their teams and be giving real time feedback. And that level of real time feedback helps boost clarity much better than waiting for an annual review. So I, it's, I don't think that anyone is suggesting that reviews are not necessary. It's the way we've been traditionally doing them that has some elements that aren't as effective as doing different kinds of performance reviews. Uh, next question. You mentioned a handout. Where do I get that? Yeah, several of you said it. It's actually on your um, your control panel. It's at the bottom. There's a handouts area, and it's a PDF that you can download. So you should be able to see that on your control panel where it has you know, all the different controls. Sound, raising your hand, it's on that same panel. You raise your hand, that type of thing. Um, okay, Karen, I think that this webinar is about how to prepare Project Charter before Kaizen event or preparation before Six Sigma or um, I don't, I'm, I'm going to skip that. I don't understand that. that. No, that's not what this webinar is about. Um, next question. I noticed the standard work you show does not take cycle time or tack time in it. How important do you feel it is and when do you use it and not use it? I'm thinking about the application in healthcare ambulatory clinic setting. Ooh, good question, Frank. Um, so tack time is very, very important and very, very valuable. Anytime you've got a production environment. So this is where you have this cadence to work being done. And anytime you've got that, you've got to use tack time. Tack time becomes a little less helpful in an area where you've got very, very high variation and you have workers that are juggling lots and lots of different types of work, many of which have you know, differing process times. It's less easy to use it. And so we tend not to use tack time in those environments. Now, with phlebotomy, which is what that standard work was, in that case, you actually can do tack time. You've got the number of patients who need their blood drawn. You've got the time it takes to draw on average one patient. Then you can do the tack time pretty easily once you factor in the distance that, they, that the phlebotomists have to walk. So you can use that. I, you know, I actually don't include tack time in standard work. Um, Usually the process design itself, a flow chart or a work breakdown structure, that's when we would put things like tack time. <coughs> I hope that helps. Okay, next question. Um, most companies with which I've worked in the past come to the same conclusion when asked why they do what they do, and that's to be profitable. How this conflicts with the emotional example. So I say very clearly in the book, if, you're, if people think their purpose is to make money, they could not be more wrong. And any organization that says their purpose is to make money, I guarantee you, is not going to perform at high levels. Because money is the, is the outcome of operating for a different reason. And if you operate with, a, with purity, 
and clarity and consistency around that reason for existence, the money will come, assuming you, you know, price correctly and, and assuming that it's a, some, a service the market actually wants, the money will come. So money is an outcome. Money is not the goal. The goal was to provide a service. And, you know, this has been talked about for decades in business literature and companies and leaders that don't get that, you know, I, I won't even take a client if they think that their, their purpose is to make money. So, um, yeah, I could, I could go on and on about that. <laughs> so, let, but let's go on more questions. Oh my gosh. So many good questions. Um, the value stream future state map is only half the picture from manufacturing engineering perspective. Uh, so there are things that known as value stream segments, and it is legitimate to map a value stream segment and then connect the various segments to a larger value stream. In the service sector, which is what that's from, it's actually you know a pretty big value stream, and so to try to do it all at once would be a little bit unwieldy. So you can do value stream segments. The next question: Could you comment on the idea of not needing managers and your idea of clarity? Yeah, no, I think you need, you need managers. I didn't I didn't say that. I hope I didn't say that. What I don't believe is that managers should be managing people. I believe that they should be managing the work and need to become process um, experts to a large degree in order to manage the work. So I talk a lot in the book about internal improvement professionals and the risk I see of organizations over relying on that team to be the process experts. And, you know, you don't have to have a black belt to be a process expert. It, you know, it helps to have the additional analytical abilities that a black belt has. Um, but managers need to understand how to craft and document processes. That's, you know, you know, a C-level leader, chief, chief, doesn't necessarily need to know that, but managers are close to the work and they do need to know that. When you get very, very well designed and well managed processes, the work takes care of itself. So you actually don't have nearly the perceived people problems and all those things, because it's never about the people. Rarely is there a people problem that's really a people problem. It's almost all a work system or a process problem that leads to the perception that it's a people pr problem and the people are not performing. So, oh, we're out of time. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that we didn't get through. There's such good questions. Um, let me just see if there's one more to run through really quickly. Um, da, 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 da. Oh, just really quickly, um, Jackie's question about leaders confusing strategy deployment for multi-year innovative initiatives with strategy deployment for achieving this year's targets. Um, you know, I just, I just put the boundaries on them and say stra your strategy deployment plan or your Hoshin plan is for a fiscal year or a calendar year or whatever you want to say. It's for a year. That's the time period. And that's all you should be focusing on right now because we don't know what's going to happen six months from now. Business changes very quickly. So just, you know, that's what it is. It just help them understand that they're not supposed to be doing detailed planning for five years. They can have high level ideas, but detailed planning is one year. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. I hope to see you. Don't forget to take the Clarity Quiz to see where you're rating, and I'll see you in the next webinar. Have a great evening or day wherever you are. Bye-bye.